What's up guys, this is Chris aka Barn on 11970. Thank you as always for taking the time to check out this video. Um, one of the things I was always good at at making videos is kind of making complicated things or what seem to be complicated things very simple by putting them in better perspectives. And I see all the time from people that watch some of my videos, especially newer people, they say things like, well, how do we change the world? How do we change things? The idea is to understand the enemy, the people that rule against people. And I know when people say, oh, rulers and stuff, it makes people seem like, oh, God, here we go, one of those conspiracy theorists. But I, I want to put it in perspective. Now, ask yourself these questions. I mean, watch this with somebody who is a quote-unquote non-believer and thinks everything's wonderful. Ask them to name five politicians in their lifetime that have been full of integrity and have pretty much kept the promises that they promised people before they got elected in lifetime. I'm talking not just president, I'm talking governors, senators, mayors, any politician. Can you name five? So if you have to pause the video and ask these people or the person name five and they'll struggle to find one. The point is, the people who are the ones that create the laws are not the ones in power. Because if we know anything about power, power comes from wealth. Now, if you're a politician, you're basically the go-to person for the one that is taking the blunt of the blame, the praise, the hits from the people. And they make lots of money from people behind the scenes influencing them to either pass a law or never make a law ever come into existence. It's all about how much money can you give somebody that's in charge of something that controls over us or regulates us. Now think of it this way. Who is the final authority over what can and cannot be placed in your food? Now that's the FDA. That's run by the government. Okay, that's number one. Who is in charge of what can and cannot be placed in your medicines? Again, that's the government. Who is responsible for what can and cannot be taught in schools? The final say. Well, that's government again. Who is in charge of what can and cannot be said in news? That's the FCC, isn't it? Government regulated. You see where I'm going? The very people that are in control of where you get your information, what you consume, even things like electricity, your energy sources, all the things that you need, they're in charge of. And yet, I can pretty much assume that the people you talk to about naming five people in your lifetime struggled to find more than one. Now see if you put that in perspective. The very people that we put our trust in, who are well known to be corrupted, I mean, it's very easy. I mean, look at election times. Instead of them debating on how good they are at what particular thing they believe in, they're too busy talking about that person's scandal and this person's fraud and that person's mistakes. So they are acknowledging to each other because it's back and forth. You ever see a commercial where a Republican and a Democrat are going head to head and one's trashing the other and this one's trashing him. It goes back and forth. So they're pretty much telling you pretty much everybody's corrupt in some way, but they're yet still in charge. Why is this happening? Now, if you saw the video I made a couple of days ago, whenever I post this video, the short little 30 second video where it says, because we allow them to, I made that short for a reason because that's pretty much the answer. We allow them because it's easier. Because think of a prisoner. If you're in jail for, let's say you go to jail at 18 and you're in jail until you're 75 and your whole life, you're used to people taking care of you. You're used to them telling you when to get up. They're telling you when to eat. They serve you your food. They provide you your food. They give you your clothing. They wash your clothes for you. They regulate when you go to sleep, when you can play. 
everything in your life is regulated. And then one day, somebody just opens your cage on your 76th birthday and says, you're free to go. That person is going to crawl into the corner of that cage and beg them to close the door because his whole life has been being taken care of, being regulated. And they get used to it and the security, because he's relatively safe. I mean, I'm sure there are problems. I've never been to prison, but I'm sure some of the stories you hear might be true. I don't know. I can't confirm them. Luckily, I've never been a person that's done anything worthy of going to prison for. But he's got a home. Doesn't have to pay rent. Has food. Doesn't have to go shopping. Has his clothes provided for him. Has water to drink and to shower and bathe with. Now, of course, it's not a luxury hotel, but they're so used to being told what to do and when, to, how to do it and all the other things that go with it, that that person doesn't want the freedom. So if you think about that with us, yes, we're free, but we're not really free. Take all your possessions and try and leave whatever country you're in and see how fast you get stopped, how fast you get questioned. Oh, why do you have all that stuff? Where are you going? What's the value of it? Why don't you have your regulated, regulated paper, your documents? It's not freedom. It's the illusion of freedom. But we allow this because it's easy, because they provide us things like welfare. They provide us things like credit cards and bank loans and all these different things that they give us. And we become like the Stockholm Syndrome. We become in love with our captors. And because it's happened for so long, you just get used to it. And the way to stop it is by no longer participating. It's like the movie War Games. In War Games, if you never saw it, it's I think in 1983, Matthew Broderick was the main character in this movie. He hacks into a government computer where they started a what's called, I think it was WAP um, or Warp or something like that. But originally, the nuclear power in a country, especially in America, was done by men. And they used to do tests where they'd have to see if those people would actually turn those keys to launch missiles against the Soviet Union. And they found so many times that human error or the human emotion played in that most people did not turn the keys. So they ended up ultimately making a master computer for its time that would basically make the decision. Now, computers, they don't have emotions. That's why, like, when you see Terminator movies, when they're, when those robots are killing people, they're not going to stop because they see somebody crying. They have no emotion. So the computer could not regulate. And all it did was calculate the, the risk involved. So in other words, a computer would say, well, if we kill, let's say there's 20 million Americans and 25 million Russians, and I know this more, but let's just say it's that. If we kill 24 million Russians and only 16 million of our Americans die, then according to a computer, that's a win because more Americans beat the less Russians. So it calculated in that way. So when Matthew Broderick goes into the computer thinking he's playing a game, he activates the computer to do what he thought was a simulation of nuclear war, but the computer thought of it as a real thing. It was going to launch the missiles against Russia, and it was calculating what would be suitable risk, suitable loss, because again, computers don't have emotion. So at the end of the movie, basically, he's trying to teach the computer that sometimes there is a no-win scenario, that it doesn't matter if you win, if you have 10 Americans left and there are only one or two Russians left, you didn't really win because you killed 99% of your people. Just because you have a few more doesn't make it a win. So he's trying to teach a computer that not everything can be beaten in one. So he starts teaching the computer to play tic-tac-toe. And then he starts getting it to play against itself. And every time it kept going as a draw and a tie. Long story short, the computer says the best way to beat the game is to not play. Let's give another scenario. Let's say you're um, the owner of Verizon Wireless. You're the owner, 100% stockholder. You own the entire company. And your service, you charge the average rate of $100 a month for your services. You've been doing it for years. People are very happy with the service and you're making your money. 
Well, you decide you want to make more money and you decide to raise their monthly rates from 100 a month to 500 just because you can. Now, the average person is going to be upset about that. The average person, if you think of it from what other situations and governments and people with problems with governments do, they'll write up a sign that says unfair, go to the Verizon store, the main headquarters and pick it outside and protest. Now, most people think, especially if, if they're peaceful, they think they're doing a good thing. In a way they are, but in a way they're not. And I'll explain why, because it's called drowning in good intention. If you're, Verizon, if you're the owner of Verizon and you look out your window and peaceful protesters are outside, they're picketing, holding up their signs, saying how unfair, and they're all angry at you, but they're still paying their bills. Do you really care that they're there? No, because what they're, they're doing is giving you free advertisement. Because think about it. You, you, you ever hear the expression, there is no bad press? Well, what do you think is going to happen if 50, 100, 1,000, 5,000 people protest outside the Verizon wireless building? Well, there's going to be news crews there, and they're going to be talking about your business. So you as the owner of Verizon, if the people there are still paying their bills, who cares if they're complaining about it? You're still making your money. You've given, they've given you no incentives to stop. And that's what you see governments doing. They do it a little bit at a time. They add more and more things that get us to the point where we're aggravated or stressed out, but we still participate in them willingly. Because if you know anything about the 13th Amendment, it talks about slavery as being involuntary servitude. In other words, they cannot take you and force you to do something. Otherwise, that's considered slavery according to the law. But if they can get you to volunteer to do it, then it's not involuntary servitude. You're volunteering your servitude. They can get away with you as being a slave. You just think of slave as a different way of what you were taught in schools. Remember, schools are regulated by governments. That's why, and you can show this to any person, any new person out there. Ask the person next to you if you're watching this with somebody who doesn't believe in stuff, because belief is irrelevant. You don't have to believe in air to breathe it. But I want you to ask them, and you could look this up on Google. Ask them who the first president of the United States was. They'll say George Washington. Now, if you want to know who was really the first president, type in, go to Google or go to whatever search engine and type in who was the real first president. And you'll see a different name. The point of the matter is, if you're not happy with what any government in any part of the world at any point in history does, rioting creates more laws, gives them more justification to put you in jail or murder you. Peaceful protests don't work. It, it, you, people think they do, but if you're like they say, like Roth, one of the Rothschilds, I think it was Nathaniel Rothschild once said, let them march all they want as long as they pay their taxes. So who cares if you're sitting there saying, oh, these taxes are unfair, but you're still paying them? Voluntary servitude. My point is, when the people are ready to no longer play the game, there will be no bloodshed. There will be no shots fired. There will be no burned buildings. There will be no people in jail. The reason the governments throughout the world, and I can only talk mainly about this government because that's where I live, but the reason that the Constitution, the Constitution, works is it's the consent of the governed. Now, I've said this in other videos, but just to make it clear so people comprehend what I'm saying. You don't have to agree with something to consent. When you don't argue it, you're still consenting. If you're participating in it, even if you're saying, you know, if somebody's punching you in the face and you're sitting there as he's punching you and you're saying, wow, I don't like this and oh, this hurts and I can't believe they're doing this. This is unfair and oh, you're going to break my jaw and I don't like this and if you're standing there and allowing them to do it, you're consenting. You're saying it's okay because you're not stopping them.
you're complaining, but you're not stopping it. Once you move out of the way or you fight back, you'll win and you won't get punched anymore. So when it comes to governments, everybody throughout history has always complained that, oh, this is unfair and I don't like what they're doing to me and it's unjust and blah, blah, blah. But they still pay their taxes. They still send their children to go fight battles for corporations so they can get richer by stealing the property and wealth of other nations because they have different colored skin or different belief systems. And we justify it because it gives us a pretty new television. When we stop pampering ourselves and justifying things, things will get better. But until then, you're that prisoner in that cage begging them to shut the door. What sacrifices are you willing to make? I don't own credit cards. I don't even have a banking account. I have a federal credit union, but it's not a bank. I don't watch mainstream TV. I don't even have a cable box. Don't go to the movies. I support local businesses. I work for myself. People may not like these. There are some people that may not like these. For whatever reasons, they decided to hate on something I decided to do. But these are my businesses. Being a massage therapist, being a karaoke DJ, making my Oregon products. Whether you believe in them or not, it doesn't matter. Because belief is irrelevant. I can tell you that there's radioactivity in a room and you could walk in there and not see it, not smell it, not taste it. But if there's radioactivity in that room and you walk in there and you say, well, I don't believe it because I don't feel any different. You think it's not going to kill you because you didn't believe in it. But what about the air around you? Can you point out an air molecule? Can you describe what it tastes like or what it looks like or what it smells like? So you could say, well, they say there's air around me. I don't believe in it. Does that mean you're not breathing it? Belief is irrelevant. But when it comes to what I'm doing, I have my own businesses instead of working for corporations, justifying by giving them money. I don't participate in the stock market because, yes, you can make lots of money in it, but you are helping the system stay corrupt. And justifying it with the money that you take home with it. And it angers some people. Well, it's all choices we make. So if you choose to dance with the devil, don't complain about getting burned. And until people comprehend this fact that you have to make sacrifices and you have to not play the game, it's never going to change. That's why it never has changed. The technology has changed. The way they've ingeniously enslaved people by making them enslave themselves, that will not change. It's gotten better in their aspect. I mean, if you think about it, the people that are in control of this whole thing, it's, it's, it's pure genius. They've gotten people to regulate themselves. And I'll give you another example of how they do this. Let's go back to the days of the Middle Ages. Let's say you're the king of England. Now, England, it may be a small country as compared to Europe and the rest of the world, but, you know, it's not something you'd want to go crawl on your hands and knees to go from one end to the other. It's a large country in that aspect. And if you're a king in the Middle Ages where there's no cell phones, there's no newspaper, there's no TV, there's no airplanes, there's no amenities that we have today, the king of England profits off of the labor of the people the peasants. So he needs the people there to do the work for him, to pay the taxes so the king can live the lavish lifestyle that he lives. If you treat the people unfairly, they're going to want to move away. Now, if you're king of England, can you build a wall around the entire country to, to keep people from leaving? You probably could, but you'd spend a lot of money. And if we know anything about walls, people can scale them. They can climb underneath them. They can destroy them. So that won't work realistically. Could you threaten to put people in prison? Sure, you'll get a bunch of them. 
But many people will say, wow, they're putting people in prison. I'm out of here. Could you hire enough people to guard everybody? 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year? Not going to happen. But this is what they did. If you know anything about the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, one of the biggest fears that the people had was you could not travel west. Because if you did, you would know because everybody was told for centuries that the world was flat. And if you said the world was round, you were the conspiracy theorist of your day and you would be laughed at because the masses don't know what they're talking about. They only go by what they're told. So they, the peasants, even though they were being treated unfairly, they were being overtaxed. They could have had people get killed or thrown in prison. The king could have said, I want your wife and has said he has legal claim over that person could just snatch your wife and take her away or your daughters or whatever. And you stayed because of the fact you were afraid that if you traveled too far to the West, you would fall off the edge of the earth and fall out into space. Or a sea monster would come and kill you before you even got to the edge. Can't go east because you had all of those crazy cannibalistic barbarians. And they'll eat you alive or take you and torture you or turn you into their slaves. How true are those stories? Well, do you know anybody that's ever been eaten by a sea monster? Ever hear of or see a video of somebody falling off the side of the earth? Fear is control. So they got those people to regulate themselves. So they would sit there in their little property with no money saying how unfair the king is while they're plowing their fields. King's taking half of his crops, most of his money. There's famine. The people are poor. They're sick. They're hungry. They're not taken care of. And yet they still stay because it beats falling off the edge of the earth, being eaten by a sea monster, or becoming slaves for these barbarian tribes, which were the terrorists of the, their day. And then when people that were smart, like Galileo, would come along and say, the world is not flat, it's round. The earth is not the center of the universe. It's not even the center of our solar system. The sun is, and we revolve around it, not the other way around. Well, like I said, he was the conspiracy theorist of his day. They ridiculed him. They laughed at him. They made fun of him. The masses all said, oh, you're crazy. And they threw him in prison where he died. You control the masses by silencing and abusing and making fun of the little people, the smarter people. The people who think. The people that don't follow. The ones that lead. And that attracts evil. So like that video game, when you're playing a video game, you're always leading towards an enemy. And that means you're going in the right direction. But until people comprehend that they have to get rid of their luxuries, I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. Sometimes you got to take two steps back to make three steps forward. And until people are ready to do that, until people are ready to say, no, thank you for government handouts. And yes, one of the one of the reasons why I haven't made that many videos this year is I've had a lot of things happen to me with the radiator, with the new cat and the, 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 the dental problems it had and my truck and my other car and all one on after the other. But you know what? I didn't stop and get government assistance. I'm not on food stamps or welfare. I had to work extra hard so I could earn to be able to pay my debts and fix the problems that I had. And it wasn't always easy. But I sacrificed. And now I'm doing things that I enjoy. And I've been focusing more on the things that I enjoy, the positive things in life. And... My life is not completely wonderful, but it is my life the way I've made it. And I've stepped away from the mainstream. I've stepped away from the government rule. I've stepped away from the control system and doing what everybody else does because it's what everybody says you should do. And people don't like that because then it changes the system. Change is good if it's for the better.
we've had the same thing for thousands of years, just different technologies that can make it easier and easier to control us and enslave us. They want you to riot because then they can create new laws. They can pepper spray you. They can throw you in jail. They can even shoot and kill you. And call it an accident and get a paid vacation every now and then. They want you to protest, even peacefully, because it gives them free advertisement. You're still paying for the very things you're complaining about. You're not changing it. Because like they say, law is based on presumption. They're presuming you know everything about the law. So if you're not stopping them from doing it, they're sitting there saying, well, they must like it. They're not stopping it. They get, they keep getting punched in the face and they're sitting there saying they don't like it, but yet why don't they move? Why don't they stop it? They must like it. So governments throughout the world are giving you exactly what you want. You really don't want it. That's the ironic part, but you're not doing what it takes to no longer participate in it. So they're assuming, well, not only do you want it, they must want more. And they'll keep testing the waters. It's like being in a relationship where let's say you're married and you cheat on your spouse and they forgive you. You do it again. They get mad, but they forgive you again. You keep doing it to test and see. And if that person keeps forgiving you, then you could say, well, I guess I can do it anytime I want because the person will just forgive me. The day you say no more and you tell that person to leave your house and they're devastated by their loss is when they realize I have to pay for my consequences, for my actions. We're not letting them pay. Let them march all they want as long as they pay their taxes. And people say, well, we have to. That's what they tell you. What do you think they could do? Let's say there are 350 million Americans. If 300 million Americans decided today's the day I'm no longer going to pay my mortgage or I'm no longer going to pay my taxes, what do you think they can do? Do you think they have enough prisons to put that many people in jail? I don't think so. And if, if 100 to 200 million Americans turned around and said to the president, we no longer want what your government is giving us. We refuse to acknowledge sending our kids to war so you could profit off of their other people's deaths. And we don't condone it anymore. And we turn away from it and no longer participate in it by giving you money so you can do it and justify it by saying you're a war hero. And I'm sorry, when you are working for the military, and there's going to be very, very many people that are angry about this. Whether you know it or not, you're helping them expand their propaganda with murder so they could profit off of the people and exploit them. Why do you think there are so many jobs now shipped over to China? Well, don't we have a problem with Russia because of the fact that they're a communist country? Isn't that one of the main reasons? They're always talking about, oh, they're communists. Well, why do people forget so quickly that China is actually more pure communism than Russia ever it was? But we have no problem putting all our business there, working with them, politicians working with them all the time. Look at half the products in your house. They're probably made by China or made in Hong Kong. Don't seem to have a problem there. It's the hypocrisy. So you want change? Be the change you're willing to make. If you're not willing to sacrifice, then you're not willing to make the change. So why complain? You're sitting there being punched in the face. If you're not going to move away or defend yourself, you why complain? It's going to hurt your jaw even more. And it might sound silly. It might sound crazy, but it's just that simple. It's that simple and it's that complicated because the simple solution is don't play the game. If you turn on your TV and every time you turn on your TV, all of a sudden a lightning bolt comes and shoots you in the head. Well, you'd be pretty stupid after a while if you keep turning on that TV knowing that a lightning bolt is going to shoot you in the head. If you never turn on that TV, the lightning will never hit you. Yeah, you might miss your favorite TV show, but it beats getting an electri a light bolt, an electricity, a lightning bolt stuck in your head. So I make kind of fun of it, but put it into perspective. The people don't want change. They want to be told what to wear. They want to 
worry about what happens in Hollywood over what's happening to us as a society. They want to separate the people instead of seeing we are all humans living together. But we want to see people with justification for an enemy. Well, as long as I can get my iPod at a cheap price, as long as I can get my new high-definition 4K LCD color TV, 60 inches of pure bliss... I don't care, and I'll look away at the fact that somebody in China is making about 30 cents an hour in slave labor with a suicide net around the building so they can't commit suicide so I can get that TV. I want to watch my Super Bowl. Got to go out and party and drink with my guys and my pals, my gals, too. Got to make sure I get my drink on. I don't want to worry about that. That's it's it's something that I don't want to concern myself with because then people call me a conspiracy theorist. They'll call you crazy. They'll call you tin hat, tin foil hat wearing person. When it's just somebody trying to tell our fellow brothers and sisters in the world that it's time to change. And if you want change, you got to make change. You can't sit back and wait for somebody else to do it. Because let me tell you something. Many people have said there is no Superman, but what if there was? Do you think Superman can help every single person, every single second, every moment of the day? What is he going to do when he's saving somebody else? How's he going to save you? How's he going to save the 5 million other people, or the 10 million other people, the 100 other million people? How's he going to solve everything? Can't. And we're all sitting there waiting for some hero, some new politician that's finally going to be the one that's going to save the day because they tell you more of what you want to hear. But yet, like I said earlier, you can't pick five people in your lifetime that you could say were honorable. And these are the people that are in control of what you see, read, hear, ingest, use for transportation. I mean, look at the bailouts in 2008. Not one time did the president say that, well, what we're going to do is the banks are losing money because they've been gambling your money and they've been playing all these Ponzi schemes and they lost out because basically what they were doing was committing fraud. They were stealing all of your money, which they ran out of, which most of it is made up through a thing called, um, what is it? Shit. All right. It's, it's basically made up money, uh, fractional banking. There we go. I had a brain freeze for a second. So the president says, well, you know, the banks are, are failing because they're creating these Ponzi schemes. And through fractional banking, they're creating money out of thin air, which has to be paid back with interest on money that's not created unless we borrow it. So the banks have been doing all these schemes and all these scams ran out of your money that you've been paying for. Thank you for that, by the way. So the very shareholders of the banks that we want to bail out that are too big to fail, they are actually shareholders of what's called the Federal Reserve, which is not part of the United States. And we're going to give them money to give themselves and give you the bill. Can you sign up for that? Do you think anybody do that? But no, they said through fear and through emotion saying, well, it's too, the banks are too big to fail. If we don't help give them money, the country's going to collapse and everything that we know and love is just going to fall under and this country could be no more and blah, blah, blah. And we fell for it hook, line, and sinker. And they get richer and richer as we get poorer and poorer. But we're allowing it. So hopefully this will be the last video I ever have to make in this perspective, in this situation. Because there is no other answer. If you want violence, you're going to get it. But violence begets violence. You can do all this and not have to pull one trigger or thrust one blade. And that's by no longer playing the game. But there are going to be sacrifices, and unless you're willing to get rid of the pampered lifestyle that you're so accustomed to by paying for everything with a credit card and doing all these things that help the corrupt system continue to function, things are not going to change, and that's the answer. That's the answer people don't want to hear. That's one of the reasons why I've backed away. Hello, McFly. So the, as usual, one of my longer videos, which hopefully will make up for some of the people that love to complain, complained about my 35 second video. Some people are just, that's what their lives are. They're all about just complaining. It's a hell of a life. Glad I don't have that one. So if you appreciate it, give it a thumbs up if you want to. 
If you want to be one of those people to thumb it down because you need to fit in with other people and the bar none haters or haters of realistic truth, okay, that's not going to stop information or people that will watch this and do get the insight and do get it and decide, you know what, I'm going to change. Because like my slogan says, helping unite the people one person at a time. And if I get one person to see it differently and they start going down a different path that helps other people, it's a chain reaction you can't stop. You could stop a couple of drops of water, but you can't stop an ocean. And if it's time to understand that, yes, we are individual drops of water, but together we form an ocean. Like any tsunami, it's unstoppable. So they're doing their best to keep it at one little drop at a time. When we're ready to join forces and realize that this world is not supposed to be divided through color and creed and religions and whatever, or social class, and we all sit that back and say, we're all human beings with the same air that we breathe, we see out of the same eyes, we feel, we love, we hate, we have emotion, we all pretty much look the same. I mean, we have heads and arms and hearts and stomachs and everything similar. Just because somebody else might have a different skin color doesn't mean they're less human. And until we could see that and we stop allowing our medias and our governments to tell us we should hate somebody because maybe they have what we don't. And we justify it by killing people, by calling somebody a terrorist. It's all in the eyes of the beholder that's saying it. If you used to be part of uh, an evil terrorist group that went around murdering people, and you decided you can't do that because it's wrong, and you leave, aren't you a traitor? Wasn't George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, weren't they all traitors? They were to the British government, the British king. Because remember, they were all British citizens. They were occupied by Britain. And they became traitors. So the words only have meaning depending on who's saying them. So when somebody like um, Snowden is called a traitor, they called the traitor from a corrupt system, and he was just trying to expose it. My name's Chris. It's my channel, Barnon 11970. I may not make a lot of videos these days, but I make ones that will make you think. And if you've thought at all and rethought some things that you had in your life and it helps you understand better, then I did something good. And if you share it, maybe somebody else might think the same way. And maybe one day we will all stop playing the game instead of complaining about how unfair the rules are. They're, they're playing with house money. They have nothing to lose. Don't walk into their casino. They can't take anymore. Thanks for watching, guys. Peace.